Hi, I'm just checking to see who is already joining us. Wow, we have 20 people already. That's so great. So we're going to start. Um, my name is Danielle Aim Spivak. I'm the CEO of the Friends of the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. I say friends because we're Americans and Canadians and also friends internationally, I think, that are joining us here today for our very special guest. Um, I am thrilled that Rabbi Stephen Leader is joining for this week's schmoozik. And um, thank you. Oh, that's my computer in the background with all my notes up about your fabulous book. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm very, very happy to be with you and really happy to be with everyone who's watching also. Um, so I just want to start by saying that the conversation today about the beauty of what remains, which is a very apt title considering the times we live in, um, is, is available for purchase and it might be there already or it will be within a few minutes, the information on the book and also how to follow Rabbi Leader and future conversations on the book um, and also future conversations in our line of topics, everything under the sun, whether it be music or art or culture or life. So, um, you know, I, I assume you were writing this book before the pandemic. That's correct. And, and can you tell us a little bit about kind of how things have evolved from when you started writing it until you realized it was going to end up being released during this crazy time that no one predicted? And, you yeah. know, just walk us through that a little bit. Yeah. Well, the, the backstory of the book is that three years ago, I gave a Kol Nidre sermon on 10 things that death had taught me about life. You know, uh, for those of uh, you watching who don't know me or anything about me, I'm the senior rabbi of a very large congregation in Los Angeles called Wilshire Boulevard Temple. And after, during those 30 years um, leading up to that sermon, I had this is not rabbinic hyperbole. I, I had officiated at at least a thousand funerals and walked a thousand families through this journey of, of loss and, and grief and, and trying to find meaning within it all. So I gave that sermon three years ago, Kol Nidre. And during those 30 years that led up to that sermon, I had helped all these people. And, and Danielle, I thought I was doing a really good job. I would have given myself an A minus, you know? And then one year to the day after I delivered that sermon, we buried my father after a 10 year journey through Alzheimer's. So the morning of Kol Nidre, I was in Minneapolis at the cemetery to bury my father. And what that entire experience during and after taught me was that I needed to reevaluate that sermon. By the way, that sermon was unbelievably popular when it went all over the world. I had you know, tons of requests for it. But I realized, as I say in the, in the prologue of the book, that that sermon, based on what I had learned after the death of my father, was just 1% shy of the deepest truth that death comes to teach us about life. And so I wrote this book really to bring us down to that one degree deeper of truth that death comes to teach us about life. I had no idea when I started the book that it would land in the middle of the greatest global threat of death in probably any of our lifetimes. And I did have a chance with the final draft of the manuscript, I did have a chance to reference the pandemic here and there. But fundamentally, the book is, is very similar, if not almost identical to what it would have been otherwise. Um, it's really my apology, in a way, for the ways in which everything I was thinking and teaching and saying about death was just one degree shy of the truth. And, and that's really why I wrote the book. And we can get into the specifics of what those truths were that needed to be adjusted. Uh, but that's really the backstory of the book. And the fact that it's landed in the middle of a pandemic, other than the fact that they can't get books to the warehouses because everything is so you know chaotic now in the shipping world, 
um, I think has proven to be really fortuitous because it's helping a lot of people because the pandemic is ultimately about loss. Even if we haven't lost the life of a loved one, we've lost our freedom. We've lost our sense of invulnerability. We have lost the right to send our children to school where they belong. We've lost businesses, some of us, money, some of us. And, and most important, and, and I think challenging of all, is we've lost that basic fundamental human need to touch other people and be touched by them. You know, I, I have an 87 year old mother in Minneapolis. I haven't hugged my mother in a year. And, and so we have all suffered loss. It may not necessarily be loss of life, but it's loss and the book speaks to that and speaks to the challenge and the opportunity. This is why it's called the beauty of what remains to focus and embrace the beauty of what remains. So you were talking about the difference in experiencing or processing, say processing death from the perspective of the rabbi officiating at funerals uh, for so many years, so many families to being the son uh, mourning. Now, it's, it's amazing how the older we get, I think the more we think about our childhood in many ways, because the farther we are from that, you know, we just have time to process and learn and yes. think all, try to understand our parents from a different perspective. So, you know, how, how did that shift from being the rabbi to being the son, um, you know, how did you feel that? How did you experience that shift? Well, it was a, <clears throat> it was a journey. And it's a back and forth journey. There's, there's tension between those two roles sometimes. Sometimes those two roles are perfectly aligned, but sometimes there's tension in those two roles. Um, <clears throat> in the beginning of the book, I talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, being invited to lead Shab uh, Kabbalat Shabbat service at the Jewish nursing home in Minneapolis, my father's first weekend there. Of course, I agreed. But there I was standing in front of a group of, you know, 20 or so fairly lost souls, pretty unclear about where they were and why. And I looked out and saw my dad among them and, and how heartbreaking it was to realize, well, he is among them. He is where he belongs. And I led the service and then I walked out into the hall and broke down and cried. And that was the moment when I realized that this was going to be a journey for me from Steve Leader, the rabbi, to Steve Leader, Lenny Leader's son. And the book explores that, I guess, what I would call role tension um, in, a, in what I hope is a very moving and beautiful way. So how does someone like you, who's used to being the rock for so many other people and the person that people go to to express their grief and process their trauma and whether it be death or divorce or loss or financial loss, I'm sure you see it all as a rabbi. Yes, and yes you, I do. You yes. went into it because you welcome that kind of role and connection to people. But you know, who do, who can you turn to, or how did you how did you deal with your own personal experience in that? Well, I tried to use it. Uh, I tried. I did ask myself, what can I learn about this, both as a rabbi and as a man, and. You know, I learned a lot of things as a result of this experience. I leaned very heavily on my extraordinary wife. You know, there were times, there are still times when we'll be sitting at dinner and I'll just look at her and just say, I really miss my dad right now. And she understands, you know, her father died also. Um, a handful of friends who had loved ones suffer through Alzheimer's, but mostly I used it as a learning opportunity to share with other people. That's what I do. You know, I, I say this in the book, Graham Greene said the difference between the writer and everyone else is when something's happening, no matter how sad or tragic or chaotic, this is his quote, there's a sliver of ice in the writer that allows him to take notes. And so I have that sliver of ice most of the time and I'm gathering information to learn, to teach, to write. But there were times, in full disclosure, and there still are, when I just am crushed by it all. And, and that's one of the things I learned. You know, I, if it's okay with you, I'd like to get into what were the readjustments in my thinking and teaching that 
came about as the result of my own personal loss and experience. The first is something that I don't think people talk enough about, which is, and this has to do with the cognitive dissonance you were talking about in assessing our own childhoods and our own parents. Because there's always a tension between the parents we had and the parents we wish we had, <laughs> between the parents we thought we knew and the parents we discover as we get older, right? Who are actually mm -hmm. flawed human beings. So for me, one of the things I learned through the Alzheimer's and through my loss and through the grief is that there's a duality to memory that we do not talk about. Yes, we often say, you know, Zechat Tzadik Livracha, may his memory be for a blessing uh, and all kinds of things and it shall live on in your memory. And that's all true. It is true that memory is beautiful, but it is also true that sometimes it really hurts. I, I say in the book, this is like being caressed and spat on at the same time. That's memory. And that's the truth of memory. Sometimes when I think about my father, it's so beautiful. And sometimes when I think about my father, it is so painful. And making peace with that reality is, is, is that one degree deeper that I was talking about before. The, the next reassessment, um, I'm 60 years old and I was raised every psychology 101 class, you know, every, every class in, uh, on the subject of death, we were all raised under this thought process of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who defined stages to dying, stages to death and dying and stages to grief. And I have found that not to be true with my own experience. Uh, stealing a line from Tom Friedman in From Beirut to Jerusalem about the Middle East, and I use it differently, but the way I put it in the book is that anyone who thinks the shortest distance between two points is a straight line does not understand grief because grief is non-linear. And this business about grief having stages implies first you will feel A, then you will feel B, then you will feel C, then you will feel D, and then you're done. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. So I prefer the metaphor of waves for the experience of grief. They come very close together and they're very large at first. And then they do get further apart. And at times you even get a beautiful calm sea with weeks, months, years even of calm seas. And then when your back is turned, out of nowhere, you can be hit by a rogue wave of grief that just takes you down, just takes you down. So the change for me was the old Steve leader faced any kind of wave coming at him like this, chest out, face forward, stand my ground. I am stronger than this wave. I will take this wave. And, and the wave will respond to my will. And we all know what happens when someone has that default setting in front of a wave. We end up upside down, thrown against the rocks, gasping for air, anxious and confused and alone. The other alternative, so the new Steve leader post his father's death has learned and now teaches that when we see a wave of grief coming at us or feel a wave of grief coming at us, the thing to do is to lie down, let it wash over you and float with it. Just float with it until you can stand up again. And being able to stand up again might be a minute, it might be a day, might be a week, might be 11 months. Just float with it. And that's a very important shift when it comes to helping people through grief. So many people say, I don't, I don't feel better. What's wrong with me? And the answer is nothing is wrong with you. There is no wrong way to grieve. It is a non-linear experience. And so that's another major readjustment in my thinking as a result of what I went through and, and continue to go through, uh, you know, in, in the aftermath of my father's 10-year journey through Alzheimer's and his death. I used to say, 
let me, let me just tell everyone listening what might be obvious. There is nothing more difficult than helping a family, a parent bury a child, nothing. It is the most difficult thing rabbis do. And I've unfortunately had to do it too many times. What I used to say at the cemetery before the service would begin was I would, I would look you in the eye and I would say, Danielle, the most honest and helpful thing I can say to you right now is it won't always hurt so much. And I don't say that anymore because I learned that isn't true. What I say now is, Danielle, the most honest and helpful thing I can say to you right now is it won't always hurt so often. But when it comes, it, it cuts very deep. And that's the truth. And knowing that enables us to sort of lie down and float with it. So those are a couple of the major changes in my understanding that I articulate in the book for everyone. So a lot of what you just, um, well, wow, there was so much there. So thank you. And I could listen to you talk for hours. You, you express that so beautifully. No pun intended with the name of your book, The Beauty of What Remains. Um, when, when we talk about music, we talk about timing. And you talked a lot about timing as well. Um, can you share with us some of your, your own memories and, and connections with music that oh. you talk about in the book? Because I think that's a nice little. Yeah, little it is. And you know, I think everyone here who's interested in music knows that music affects a different part of the brain than, than other forms of communication. And in my father's case, <clears throat> it, was, it was there longer than almost anything else. And my father essentially taught us, I'm one of five children. I, my dad and my uncle owned a junkyard. I grew up, I grew up in a blue collar working class family um, in, a, in a, about a 1400 square foot home, you know, two bedrooms, one bath, and there were seven of us and everything was fine, you know. Um, my dad worked extremely hard. He gave me a very, um, I would say, almost brutal work ethic from a very young age. I was on my hands and knees scrubbing floors and toilets at the junkyard at about seven years old. Um, my father taught through three primary things. One, brutally hard work. Two, Yiddishisms. He was sort of a professor of ideas expressed in pithy Yiddish expressions. And, and music, songs. Um, one of the themes that plays through the book are the way in which songs stimulate my memories of my father and the ways in which my father used, used songs to teach us. So one of them is uh, that simple little song, You Are My Sunshine. Uh, my dad was a very harsh, very harsh and stubborn person. I did, I did not grow up in a, you know, a particularly warm environment. But every Sunday, we would get in the Chevy station wagon, all seven of us, and go for a Sunday drive. And my dad would sing that song to us. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. And I somehow just knew, knew in that moment, how much my father loved his children. I'm sorry, this is hard. And, and to this day, that song just warms me because it, it was one of the primary ways my dad let us know that, that we were loved. And uh, Hank Williams was another. I mean, I know this, that the Friends of the Philharmonic, is, it's a highbrow crowd here and they may not, may not be that interested in Hank Williams, but uh, my father loved Hank Williams songs and he sang them all the time around us. And every, every uh, morning that I went to work with him to the junkyard, he would play Hank Williams in his car, you know, had an eight track or a cassette. Uh, and that too was the rhythm and music of my, of my childhood. And uh, I remember telling one of my siblings, my little brother, Greg, how much I was missing my dad one day. And he texted me the lyrics to I'm so lonesome I could cry. And it was, it was perfect. It's exactly how I felt. 
and and it's in that's in the book and you know then there's then there's the other ways in which music has has informed my experience of death there's a, there's a this is sort of an interesting musical uh, anomaly in the book that might interest uh, some people watching today. Uh, I don't know how many people watching know who Warren Zevon was, but he was a great songwriter. And he wrote a beautiful song uh, called Keep Me in Your Heart. And a woman whose funeral I officiated at asked for it to be played at her funeral. And we played it at her funeral and everyone was just weeping because it's such a poignant, beautiful song. And that sent me home to kind of go down the rabbit hole of that song and the rabbit hole of Warren Zevon. And I came across an interview. Warren Zevon was on the David Letterman show about 20 times, including the last time when he knew, both he and David Letterman knew that Warren Zevon was gonna die within a matter of weeks or months. And David Letterman fearlessly and artfully interviewed Warren Zevon and got him to talk about what it's like to know that your death will soon be upon you. And it was so beautifully done. And I wanted to include that interview in the book and the fact that at the end of that show, backstage, Warren Zevon put his guitar in his case and gave it to David Letterman as a gift. I discover that David Letterman had never in all these years since had never licensed anyone the right to use any of his Warren Zevon interviews. They were just too private and too emotional for him. I reached out and he read, he read the manuscript and he gave me permission. First person ever to get permission to use that interview um, in, in the book. And, and it's such a beautiful expression of showing up for someone fearlessly during the end of his or her life. And showing up is a big theme in the book. You know, how important it is to just show up and be authentic when you are there for someone who's dying or for their loved ones who are mourning. Yeah, you know, that. thank you for bringing that up. I, I think that it's, especially for young people, um, I think for anyone, but especially with, when you're, you know, young, like in your teens or 20s or even 30s and somebody around you is sick or someone you know has experienced a loss, you never want to, you know, people don't, I'm including myself in this, we don't want to say the wrong thing. Mm. We don't want to rub salt on a wound. Yes, yes. And I think in turn, you know, often the conversation goes unsaid at all because it's it's an uncomfortable moment and no one wants yep. to perpetuate discomfort for anyone else, right? Well, the good, I, but I, I get this question a lot and I have over the years and I, I always answer now, having been a mourner myself, with three words followed by two words. The first three words are just show up. People call me all the time, Steve, my best friend from college was just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He's got three to six months. I'm flying back to New York to say goodbye. What do I say? First three words, just show up. And followed by two very important words, be authentic. Be authentic, right? When you show up, don't show up with this like phony, long, oh, Danielle, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's so terrible happening. Oh, that's not what people need. That's not what the dying need. And that's not what mourners need. They need you to be with them in death, exactly who you were with them in life, because that is the only thing that assures them the bottom hasn't fallen out of the world. So you don't need to know what to say. You just need to show up and be yourself. If you're a hugger, hug. If you're a joker, joke. If you're a feeder, feed. You know, if you're a hand holder, hold hands. If you're a listener, listen. Just be real. The rest will take care of itself. You know, even after 33 plus years of standing outside in the hallway before I go into a hospital room or standing on a front step before I walk in a home, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know. I just know 
It's my obligation to walk through that door and be real. The rest really does take care of itself. I mean, you know how to be you. So just walk in the door and be you. And that is the most welcome of all gifts. So, you know, now that you're thinking about, you know, what the future means also on an institutional level, um, as people kind of hopefully in a year or so, we're, we're going to be ahead of where we are right now. Um, I, just thinking about what you're saying in terms of showing up. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you and your institution have been doing a lot of introspection about what the future look like. Yeah. And without going into you know details, what what do you think? What do you think has been a positive kind of outcome of this reflection, and and where has it made you go towards and thought or plans that you weren't already kind of going or trending towards? Well, you know, I remember when everyone thought Blockbuster was going to be the end of movie theaters. And Blockbuster is gone and movie theaters are not. So I'm still a big believer in bricks and mortar. People need to be together. And by the way, in my particular case, when we're talking about a synagogue, the driver of all synagogues is the pediatrics of the synagogue. What do you do for young children? And I think one of the things we've all discovered as adults is Zoom is pretty amazing. And one of the things those of us with children have discovered is it's not very amazing. OK, there are a lot of limitations to virtual learning for children, a lot. It's not great. And we are a very school driven. I mean, we have a lot of other things, social service center and a big new gathering place we've built. But I'm we've doubled down on bricks and mortar. We're merging with another synagogue in West Los Angeles. We're, we're growing our footprint, not shrinking, because I'm I am a believer. First of all, there's going to be tremendous pent up demand when this is over for people to come together. I think it's gonna be like spring break for a year all over America, maybe all over the world, I don't know. And children and families need, need to be physically together. And we need to be together when we pray as much as we can. Now, that being said, we've learned a lot about the advantages of certain, certain aspects of, of virtual communication and connection. I think what we'll always have now going forward is a kind of hybrid model where we'll have parallel things happening or whatever's happening live will generally be also live streamed and things like that. But I do not by any means think this marks, you know, the end of, of Jewish institutional life or the importance of Jewish sacred spaces for people to gather. I, I think quite, quite the contrary. Um, so you people are yearning for that. So I'm not at all pessimistic about it, not at all. Yeah, I actually, yeah, I totally agree with you. And um, I think people will appreciate actually those yeah. in-person experiences much more than we ever have before, well, which ties into gratitude, which is exactly. also something you talk about in exactly. your book. I would, you're, you're thinking exactly what I was thinking is that loss does intensify gratitude, ideally. It really does. Um, you know, the pandemic and, and loss in general, it strips away a lot of nonsense, a lot. And this is also, this is why I call the book, The Beauty of What Remains. Loss strips away so much and what remains is so beautiful uh, and, and so much to be appreciated, you know? And, and I think that's absolutely true of the pandemic. And I will say on a personal level, there are some things I'm not going to do again as a result of this pandemic. I have a, I'm not going to spend my life on the 405 and the 10 trying to get to a meeting so I can meet with, you know, 45 minutes in the car to meet with three other people that I could just as easily Zoom, Zoom with. What was I thinking? What was I doing? You know, I am never again going to allow millennials to stay in the middle or the back of the line at our institution. I'm pushing them to the front because they know how to navigate and lead and create in this environment. I, I have such enormous respect for the millennials who work for us and what they've been able to do and the ways they've been able to help all of us grow. That's another thing. This might sound silly, but I think most of us will understand it. I have a closet upstairs full of uncomfortable clothes that I'm not gonna wear anymore. You know, 
what, what was I doing? What was I doing being uncomfortable to impress who? No one cares. You know, I think that, that that's sort of, these are some positive components of all of this. Um, so, you know, I think personally, it's been a tremendous, I also, people say, how is it to lead a big synagogue during the pandemic? Personally, I think it's epic, epic. I don't for a moment mean to dismiss the pain and suffering of the pandemic, but it is an epic time to lead, amazing time to lead. It's an incredible challenge. And I personally find it really invigorating, really invigorating. So that's my, that's my take on it. Well, we, okay. So we've touched on a ton of um, powerful concepts and, you know, your own personal experiences. I have a lot more I'd love to ask, but Zach, do you want to just give us some of the questions that are coming from the Q&A? Absolutely. And yeah, we do have some coming in from the Q&A. And if you haven't already asked your question, but you have one, I would really recommend you use the Q&A function to ask and we'll ask uh, Rabbi Steve live on the air. So we're actually having a lot more come in right now. One we have is from Lydia. And she says, at a funeral last week, the rabbi said, don't think of, don't think of it as death. Think of it as life. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not sure what the it was. Don't, so I think, I, I think death. Don't think of death as death. Think of it as life. Yes. I'm not sure what the rabbi meant, except the way I would interpret that statement is that, and, and this is a very, I think, powerful point. I think death is the great teacher, the great teacher when it comes to imbuing our lives with more meaning. And, and that is, again, why I called the book The Beauty of What Remains. Death really does teach life. Now, whether death is actually life for the person who has died, you know, that's impossible to know because you have to die to realize that vision and no one's coming back to talk about it, of course. So I'm, I'm not sure that I can confirm that. What I can confirm is every brush with death for us is a brush with life that, it, that it, it makes us value, or ideally should make us value our lives more and make more of our lives. Uh, and, and there's no question that my father's death changed me in certain ways that have enabled me to enjoy life more, not less, more. Um, the fact that life is finite, you know, is extremely important. Kafka said the meaning of life is that it ends. And it's true, it's so simple but so true. Imagine a deathless life. What would a deathless life be like? I think it would be meaningless. What would love be in a deathless life? How could two people really love each other in a, if they were both deathless? Who would have children? Who would have ambition? Uh, Wallace Stevens, the poet, so beautiful what he said. He said, he, I'm paraphrasing, but basically he said, the beauty of a flower is that it fades. I mean, why are we never moved by plastic flowers? They don't move us. They don't thrill us. They don't, they don't uplift us. I very much dislike plastic flowers. Ex they right, exactly, mm -hmm. because they're immortal in a sense. They're boring. It's not real. It's, it's death that makes life real and meaningful and powerful and precious. And if that's what the rabbi meant, I, I agree with him completely. Thank you for that. Um, Beth had a question, and I'll paraphrase here, but she says, do you think rabbis see death differently with all the death that they help their congregate, congregants um, deal with and cope with and work through? Um, and if not, should they? Well, we have to. This is that shard of ice I was talking about earlier. You know, if we over-personalized each death, I, I look, I, I have a pretty solid shard of ice in me that allows me to get, take people through these experiences without it crushing me. Although it does, there is collateral damage for sure. I mean, I am often just spent and wrung out. I was at the cemetery, I had four funerals last week and I already have two for this week. So I'm not telling you it's easy, but this is in a sense, the tension that the book explores is, what happened to me when I had to get out of that role or I was pulled out of that role? 
and moved from Steve Leader, the rabbi, to Steve Leader, the son. And I will tell you, it is different. It is very different. And that's what the book is about. And that's why I think the book is resonating so deeply with people is it, it's like this guy has been where I am as a, as a human being. Now, he has the experience of a rabbi to help create some scaffolding around the journey. But this guy's been in the thick of it like I have. And, and I think it is different. And, and I'm glad it's different. I'm glad that I felt my father's death differently than I might feel the death of a member of the temple who needs, you know, whose family comes to me to officiate at a funeral. It's not the same. If it ever became the same, I would say shame on me. Shame on me if I was Rabbi Steve Leader at home. So we also have some viewers watching from Facebook. So hello to everyone watching on Facebook. Uh, Lisa, who is watching there, asks, uh, I'm feeling my mom already has left me, even though she is alive and dealing with Alzheimer's. Mm. Did you personally go through the stage of pre-grief? I'll go, listen, I don't, I don't even like the phrase pre-grief because I think we should just be straight up about this. People with this, these kinds of diseases, including my father, they die twice. It's not pre-grief, it's grief. I had to bury my father twice. Once when his mind was no longer who he was. He, he was gone. That wasn't my father. That was a different person. My father was gone. And then when his body died, he was also gone. So I don't think of it in my case, I can only speak for myself. We only really know about our own grief, not someone else's. I can only say that I, I feel that my father died twice and, and therefore I wouldn't even call it pre-grief. And I would say to whoever asked this question, what you're feeling is very real and very normal. And you have every right to grieve the death of your mother's mind which is in essence your mother. You have every right to grieve that. Um, and, and then later you will grieve the death of her body. That's the truth of it. Um, Zach, can I just, I'm gonna step in and just say, you know, the theme of our programming this month um, connects to the fact that this week is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Mm -hmm. That was, I believe assigned by the UN, which is different sure. than a Shoah that Correct. Um, at least this year will fall um, later in April. But what, you know, knowing that that so much of this grief, first of all, I mean, there are, there are a lot of Holocaust survivors still alive that are also suffering once again with this pandemic. And uh, I'm sure deal with trauma could be minute to minute. And it, it didn't take the pandemic to have to kind of bring it to light again, but, you know, what do you say to people close to you or in your congregation or, um, you know, who especially this week are kind of re retackling that challenge? Lie down, let it wash over you, float with it. It's very real, this grief. And the PTSD is very real. And, and trying to push against it or deny it, in my opinion, is not the way to go. You know, there's an old saying, you can't push a river upstream. You just can't. You have to, you know, I shouldn't say you have to. I find it better to just recognize it as a wave of grief. Lie down, be in it. Realize you've gotten up from this wave before and you will get up from this wave again. But this wave will always be a part of your life. And that's the truth of it. And that's different than saying to people, you know, you'll, it'll get better. You'll get over it. That isn't true. And, and if the love is real or the trauma is real, you learn to live with it, but you, I don't think you ever really get over it, whatever that means. I don't even know what that means. So I would say exactly what I would say about any form of grief. When it comes, we submit 
and then we stand up again. Thank you, Zach. Is there anything else coming in that you want to share? Yeah, there are a few more questions. Um, is there anything that you wish you did or said to your father differently? And does his death change what you communicate to others in your congregation or in life? The answer to the first question is yes. And I've said this to my four siblings. When we launched the book, I had my four siblings with me on a Zoom for the members of my congregation as in a very intimate conversation about the experience for them of reading the book and, and how the five of us were similar and different. And I said this to my siblings, I wish I had gone back home to Minneapolis more often. I, I wish I had gone more often. Um, and, you know, I'm a, obviously a busy guy. And, you know, if I do get a weekend where I don't have to be, you know, on call or on the Bema or in the cemetery or baby naming or a bris or a wedding, if I get a free weekend, it's pretty rare. And, you know, I wish I'd instead of falling asleep on the couch, maybe gotten on a plane more often. Um, so I do wish I had done that differently. Now, in terms of, do I teach anything differently to others in these circumstances? I do, and it, what I'm about to say might surprise you, but my father and I learned a new language toward the end of his life when he lost the ability to speak. And that was the language of touch. I would sit in that nursing home next to my father's. I would sit in that nursing home next to my father's wheelchair. And I would just hold his hand for hours. And we said nothing. And it was beautiful. I mean, sitting in the silence, holding my father's hand. I hadn't held my father's hand since I was a little boy. I, you know, I would sc scratch his scalp and he would, he would sigh. You know, I would rub his shoulders and he would smile. And we learned this new language. Uh, and and I, I tell people, I try to remind people, I would say it to this woman who asked the question about her mother, don't underestimate the power of touch. It's, it's, it's really beautiful and really important. And it, it says so much without uttering a single word. So that's something that I, uh, that I learned in the experience among many other things. There's so much honestly in the book about this, but the touch thing was really significant. It was the way I could communicate with my father at the end of his life. And I'm not sorry about that in one sense because it was so intimate and so beautiful. You know, every little boy, I shouldn't say every, most little boys watch their father shave in the mirror and it's just the most magical, amazing thing in the world to see. It's so manly, you know. I never in my life thought I would be shaving my father. I never, I never imagined that I would be shaving my father. And it was heartbreaking and so beautiful. And, and I try to hold on to the beautiful part of all of that. Have you, you know, the book hasn't been out that long. I think it's been like two or three weeks now, but yeah. what's the reception that, I mean, this is very personal and very universal. Um, a lot of the experiences that you went through with loss and um, I'm sure people have reached out to you with stories or people that you even knew who were close to you or in your congregation or even in your family, but you've maybe never had these conversations with them before. So, you know, can you share with us kind of what the reception has been? It has been amazing. Uh, yesterday, the book made the LA Times bestseller list and the Washington Post bestseller list, uh, Publishers Weekly bestseller list. Might as well tell. Thank you. I, I'm really, um, I'm, I'm really gratified that it's resonating with people. I think it's a combination of the fact that people don't really talk about these things very much. And I think it's also the fact that it's landed in the middle of a pandemic 
and, and the lethality of this pandemic is its own lesson about the power of death to teach us to change our lives? I mean, can you imagine if this virus wasn't lethal or as lethal, do you think for a moment the world would have paused the way it did and we'd be reevaluating how we live? Not a chance. Only death does that. And, and so anyway, the book is doing crazy well. It's a little frustrating that the publisher didn't get enough books to Amazon and we're playing catch up and, and shipping is pretty chaotic, as I said now. Barnes and Noble still has books and Amazon will have more books in a week. But the reception has been extraordinary and people are reaching out to me on Instagram mostly, but people who know me through email and telling me the most beautiful, beautiful stories. And most gratifying to me is the ways in which the book has helped them kind of rethink what they've been through or are going through. Uh, so I, I have to say it's, it's beyond what I'd hoped for, honestly. Zach I is- just, a... <laughs> just wish my father knew. Mm. He, I, I mean- Maybe well, he does. You're the rabbi, so I don't- Maybe he does. No, you say whatever you want, maybe he does. I think he knows. Yeah. Very proud. And he's watching. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting a lot of lovely notes from people watching. Not really questions, but I'll, I'll relay them to you, Rabbi. Uh, Isla says, or Ela says, hello, Rabbi Steve. Not a question, but it's so lovely to hear and see you. You still are and will always be sunshine to and for me. I know who that is. That must be Isla Lewis, my friend from Chicago. I love you, Isla. Thank you. It's beautiful. Yeah, and, Zach, seen these. This is good. I like hearing some of the positive. <laughs> oh, and there's a lot. Um, Marcia says, thank you for so much for your fabulous book. How I wish I had such a fountain of wisdom just a few short years ago. Nonetheless, mm. it is serving as a comfort today. I'm glad. You know, I did. It, it's, it's really... Um, it was complicated and difficult to write a book like this because I wanted it to be two things at the same time, which is always difficult. First, a field guide, a field guide to, to death and grief and mourning and loss. Like, where am I? What do I do? How do I do it? When do I do it? And what am I feeling? And is it okay? So part of it is a field guide. And then part of it is this exploration of my journey from rabbi to son. And, and sometimes they're parallel and sometimes they, they intersect. I think that that was the challenge in writing the book, but I think that's why the book is so different than other books out there about death. And, and I think why it's resonating so much. And you said something really very astute, Danielle, when you said it's so personal yet so universal. And I think that that's the sweet spot, you know, as a writer, all writers, I think, are trying to, trying to reveal the universal within the particular. And if, if I was able to do that in this book for people who read it, I, I will consider that, you know, everything I had hoped for and more really. So I'm glad to hear that really. But, but it's kind of like you're revisiting that pain every time you go on a Zoom to talk about the book, I'm sure. And, and I know that you're, you're big on promoting, you know, letting the wave roll over you and feeling it and not kind of running away from that feeling. But I mean, I still can imagine that the intensity of this promotion of this book is, is pretty incredible for you. You are an extremely astute interviewer. Let me just start with that. Um, you're an extremely astute person. You're right. Um, it's, it's exhausting. It's physically exhausting, but it's also emotionally exhausting. But what, what keeps me moving forward with talking about this and thinking about my own loss and so many losses I've been through with others, what keeps me moving forward are notes like the ones that Zach read for us is, is the knowledge that it's really, really helping people. The book is really putting its arms around people and comforting them and holding them. And that's, that's why I do it. You know, I've always been the kind of person who runs toward a fire. That's just my nature. I want to help people, even if it means revisiting my own mistakes and my own sadnesses and my own shortcomings. 
that that's how I'm built. I don't even know why, frankly, but I've always been that way. I've always wanted to run toward people who are suffering. Uh, and part of it is, I think, because I know so well that, you know, no one suffers pain better alone. The, the Talmud says the prisoner cannot free himself. That's such a powerful idea. The prisoner cannot free himself. When we're suffering, we have to reach out. No one endures pain better alone. No one. And when we reach out, people reach back. I find this every time I talk about the book. People reach back with so much compassion. And, and they lift me from my own suffering as I've tried to lift others. And that, to me, is also the beauty of what remains, is this the way in which death breaks us open to have these human you know, connections and, and real compassion for other people and real empathy for other people's suffering. Because if we don't have empathy for the suffering of others, we're lost. We're lost. And we have so many more great notes and comments coming in. And I know we're running up against our time block. Rabbi, do you have another 10 minutes to sit with I, us? I have another eight minutes. Eight minutes to sit <laughs> yes. with us. That's great. We can fit okay. we can fit a lot in in eight minutes. Let's go. Okay. Uh, Maxine wants to know what the name of that Warren Zevon song you mentioned is. Oh, it's, it's called Keep Me In Your Heart. It's a beautiful song. Keep Me In Your Heart. Keep Me In Your Heart. Yeah. Okay. Lulu comments and she says, it's so reassuring to have your book because for so long, everyone said to me to live in the present and not keep clinging to the past. And I didn't realize that it's not that. I've read your book twice now. Mm -hmm. oh. I'm glad Lulu, just keep it like a blanket. It's always there for you. I'm really, this is what I was saying earlier, Daniel. This is why it's worth revisiting this time and time again. It's worth it. I, I think Rabbi, one hour is not enough and we need to do a part two because I think we just we just scratched the surface of a, of a very I'll, big- I'll be glad to come back because there is there is more to talk about for sure. And I'll be glad to do that. And I think, I think the one, the overarching uh, comment or number one question we've received is, your, is about your Kol Nidre uh, sermon and how it changed um, after the death of your father and how you, the way you looked at that sermon changed. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, as I said, reassessed sort of the timeline and nonlinear, the, the, you know, the timeline of grief and it's, it's the geometry of grief, if I can put it that way. Um, you know, this idea that it won't always hurt so much. And, and I kind of, I, I just dismiss that idea now. It's really about how often it hurts, not about how much it hurts. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, there are 10 points, not all of them needed to be reassessed. I, I mean, the idea that people die the way they live was in that sermon. And I still believe that's true. In fact, I believe it's even more true, uh, that now, uh, so not everything changed, but some very important things changed. And of course the concept of memory, you know, I was one of these guys who presented memory as the most beautiful and fantastic and all of which is true, except for the other side of memory, which is how much it hurts. And, and by the way, this is what Joe Biden, the, the president was talking about in his inaugural address. I don't know how many people really focused on that part of it because it was non-political. But when he said, you know, part of healing is remembering and remembering hurts. And this is a guy who knows more about loss than any person should have to ever know, you know, a wife, a child and a son. Uh, and he's, he's right, there's a, there is a duality to memory. And I did not present it that way in the sermon and I do present it that way in the book. Um, so that deeper level is one of the big changes. Um, I, to be honest, I'd have to go back. It was three years ago and I'd have to go back and really, really reread it carefully to talk about the changes. And, and maybe that would be an interesting thing to, to do is to send it out to a group of people and then have a conversation about the readjustments. But off the top of my head, those are the two big ones. And I think we've had about 15 to 20 people asking if you could resurface that sermon during, during this talk here. Um, oh, I have it. I have it. I can't find it right now and, and give you a, you know, and put it online for you. But, but if, if people want it, uh, they can go to the Wilshire Boulevard Temple website 
and look for uh, go to go to sermon go to high holidays go to sermons keep drilling down and you'll find it it was uh, you know three years ago Kol Nidre it's uh, they're all they're all archived on our website so you, you'll be able to find it uh, wbtla.org and you'll you'll be able to find it and I'll put that in the chat um, okay. Yeah, and so Zach, you're gonna you're gonna put up all our social and also Rabbi leaders and um, and Rabbi, we're gonna so I'm gonna let you go because I know you okay. have to. Go. I want to thank you on behalf of all of us. Um, this was this was a very candid, real conversation. Thank you for being so vulnerable and um, you know working through this with us in many ways. So yeah, we really. Appreciate it. You're making it cool to feel. You're making it cool to express yourself and and show grief and show vulnerability. And um, yeah, until next time. So we Thank do this. I, I meant what I said. I appreciate the depth of your questions. It, it's not like that most times. So I appreciate you very much, and I appreciate this opportunity. And I hope I hope it helped and comforted a lot of people. It did. Take care. Have a good Bye -bye. week. Thank you. Bye, everyone.